Hello everybody, Alzebo HD, and welcome to a brand new game and a brand new series for you guys today. I'm going to be playing Hearts of Iron 4, uh, Paradox Interactive's new 4X World War II strategy game. I am very, very excited, very, very pumped, and I am ready to play, so let's go ahead and get started. So for those of you who have played Hearts of Iron 3, I have heard this game is incredibly similar. Uh, however, I have not played Hearts of Iron 3, so you'll have to bear with me through my potentially disastrous campaign here, where I will make many mistakes, but that's okay, you guys can follow through and, uh, you know, again, we can both learn from this experience. Uh, when I make mistakes, of course, these are perhaps be the mistakes that you guys will make as well. I don't know, you know, maybe you guys are professional Hearts of Iron 3 players, but perhaps you're not. So, um, view this as a learning experience really more than anything. So today we are going to be playing as Switzerland. Why did I choose Switzerland? Well, that's a good idea. First of all, let's go back really quick. Just to give you guys an idea of what you can play in this game. So, there's two scenarios at the very beginning of, uh, I suppose, the game when you load it up. You can choose to play in the 1st of January, 1936, or you can move it over into August of 1939 when the, uh, when the German Reich invades Poland. But we're going to go ahead and start off in January 1936, try to get our alliances and diplomacy and even our industry up in order before World War II breaks out. At least that's what the, uh, I guess, plan is. Of course, expectations versus reality rarely matches up with what we want. So what country are we going to be playing as today? Well, there is lots of different countries to choose from. Of course, Paradox Interactive recommends that you play one of these uh, nations over here. The large seven, I suppose, here. They are France, United States, United Kingdom, the German Reich, uh, Italy, and Soviet Union, Japan, right. So the game actually recommends that you play as Italy first. There's actually a tutorial, uh, but we're not going to do that. What, what, what fun is it to play this, these massive countries? These countries all have their own, you know, unique focus trees and idea groups and all sorts of stuff that makes them unique. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a, I guess, neutral country, right? A country that's not necessarily going to be aligned in World War II, although we will certainly make it so. And just flying around the map over here, it's absolutely beautiful. Paradox Interactive went out of their way to really make this experience feel just incredibly, you know, breathtaking. I mean, look at these uh, countries down here. If I was going to play in South America, for example, Brazil looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, you know, these colors are great. Going up here to North America, United States, Canada, of course, very, very interesting. But what I'm going to be playing today as, for you guys today, is I'm going to be playing as Switzerland. Why Switzerland? Well, that's a good question. This is a country that is notorious for its neutrality, right? Well, this is a country that normally doesn't get involved in wars. Well, in this Let's Play series, we are not only going to get involved in wars, we are going to become Hitler's best friend. Yes, that's right, Hitler's best friend. We are going to become fascist Switzerland, and we are going to lead the Swiss people into a glorious, uh, I guess, war in World War II, hopefully taking all this land over here in Austria, working our way into France. Uh, really, the sky is the limit. So let's go and get started. So as always with every Paradox Interactive game that I play in all Let's Play series, we're going to be enabling Iron Man modes, so that this way we can unlock achievements and uh, prevent us from saves coming, right? Historical AI focuses. Now this is something that is a bit... I don't want to say controversial, but this is something that has a lot in the community kind of asking, like, what exactly, what is this? You know, historical AI focus does not mean that the AI will repeat World War II exactly as it was in our history books, right? You're not going to see a Normandy invasion from the United States and Great Britain. You're not going to see, you know, Operation Barbarossa. Well, maybe you, you might. You might see a version of it, but you're not going to see it exactly when it happens and where it happens. Instead, this is simply something that says, you know, Germany is going to stay fascist. Italy is going to stay fascist. France will probably be, you know, democratic, but it might be communist. This is something that just says that, you know, the, the countries will try to stay with the national focuses that are historical. Of course, this doesn't always pan out correctly, but most of the time it does. So we're going to go ahead and stay with historical AI focuses as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with Switzerland, right? Well, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to go ahead and name this, uh, for lack of a better name. Let's go ahead and name this Fascist Switzerland. And for all those save games, I've only had this game for two days. All of these games that you see here are actually uh, time-lapse videos, and there should be more of those coming out pretty soon, maybe two or three more. So stay tuned, as always, for more time-lapse. Hopefully I'll get those out before the game actually releases, which is going to be on June the 6th. 
So the very beginning, it is January 1st of 1936, and our tiny little country of Switzerland has a very modest army. Actually, not too bad. You know, this, I, I believe we have about 20 divisions, which is a fair amount. Yeah, 20 divisions, not too bad. This is much better than, say, uh, another country that I wanted to play, which is Ireland, which only starts with one division. Uh, and they really can't recruit that much due to the fact that their population is so small. So I've decided to move down here into Central Europe. Of course, this will give us more of an opportunity to go to war. Uh, it should be more interesting in the mid to late game. So before we get started, as always with any Hearts of Iron 4 game, we need to check this bar up here to see what we are doing incorrectly, right? Because in every Paradox Interactive game, including Stellaris, Europe Universalis, uh, Crusader Kings, this will always tell you what you're missing, if there's technology or, you know, admin points that you're missing out on. Well, there's no admin points in this game. There's not even currency in this game. This currency revolves completely around resources um, and an export-based economy with civilian factories. We'll get into that in a minute. But I do not recommend watching this video for a tutorial, right? This is not going to be Quill 18's tutorial series. This is not going to be a series where I go step by step of what to do your first game. Uh, if you guys want to check that out, of course, check out Quill's videos. He's very, very good at explaining things, and he starts off as Italy. But instead, we are going to be playing as Switzerland, and you guys can kind of see exactly how disastrously this campaign is going to go, okay? Because this is my first Let's Play series in Hearts of Iron 4. This is the first campaign. So chances are this is going to go pretty, pretty badly. But Anyways, uh, I have hope in myself. I hope you guys do as well. So let's go and get started with the research, right? So in Arts of Iron 4, again, as I've said, this is not a tutorial series, but kind of just like checking out all of these different types of uh, <coughs> research trees over here. It's pretty similar to other games I've played, like Rule of Tanks, where you've got like, you know, your year and, uh, you know, kind of like this tech tree where you can branch off between different planes, different tanks, all sorts of stuff like that. Of course, this is a strategy game and not a, uh, you know, yeah. Not World of Tanks. But anyways, every game that I've started to play here, well, I've said this is my first campaign, and that's true, but I have practiced a little bit, right? So every single time I've played Hearts of Iron 4, I've always started off with electrical engineering. This tree is very, very useful because it gives you a flat research time uh, benefit, right? So the more you research in electronics, the more you get closer to uh, computers, the faster and faster your other researches will go through. So I definitely recommend starting off with that. In addition to that, I always go start off with production. Basic machine tools, very, very useful. Gives us another production efficiency cap of plus 5%. Although in this case, due to the fact that we are going to be wanting to rush our factories, we're going to actually go ahead and work on concentrated industry. Or no, sorry, I misspoke. And construction 1, which will increase our construction speed by 10%. So we're going to work on that as well. And for our third one, we're going to be working on something military-related. Now, Switzerland, unfortunately, starts off with almost nothing, right? We haven't even researched the Great War Tank from 1918. Well, why is that? Well, probably because Switzerland was just minding their own affairs, staying out of World War I, right? But we're going to need to work on armor eventually, if not immediately. We've already researched support equipment, which is very, very good. But for our first thing that we research, I'm thinking either about taking motorized, getting some motorized divisions up and running, or taking support weapons. But in actuality, we should probably take some support weapons. This is something that we should have researched in 1918, but because of our Swiss scientists focusing on Swiss chocolate, instead of Swiss uh, industry, we have uh, been a bit slow uh, on that particular note. Free civilian factories. Oh, we'll get that to that in a second. And free military factories as well. Well, for the time being, we are going to go ahead and send out all of our military factories that we have available, which I think is three more or two more, into making infantry equipment. Now, this is going to be uh, basically to arm our troops, right? Because we do have 20 divisions, but not all 20 of these divisions actually have weapons. So, in order to avoid a situation like Russia, where, say, you have more men than you have weapons, uh, we need to go ahead and get our, you know, our production queue up and running. We need to get some infantry equipment. But of course, the problem is, is that we are missing some sort of resource, which is, let's see. Okay, so we need steel. Now, how do we get steel in Hearts of Iron 4 if we are a tiny little landlocked country in the middle of a very volatile Western and Central Europe? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. This is what we're gonna need diplomacy for, right? And because we are going to be going buddy-buddy with Germany, let's go ahead and find the German Reich right here. Who doesn't quite like us right now? Because we're not actually fascist. We'll get there in a minute. 
but uh, we're Democratic nominally right now, so they're, they're not exactly our, our number one friend, but we need to trade with them. So we're going to go and pop up the trade menu, select Steel, which is the resource we want to trade for. Let's go ahead and click on the German Reich. <clears throat> and basically in this game, right, trade does not work the same way as it does in Europe Universalis, or really in any other Europe, or Paradox Interactive game, right? What you could do instead is that <clears throat> each civilian factory that you have, you're able to rent out, basically, for an amount of resources to another, uh, I suppose, nation or agent. Agent? Yeah, you guys know what I mean. So what this basically means is that I will use one of my civilian factories to make, you know, some sort of product. Perhaps it'd be a trade good, perhaps it'd be a consumer item like toilet paper. And in exchange for these items that I will export into, say, Germany... They will give me a set amount of resources in return. In this case, they will give me eight units of steel. This is all I need for the time being. We'll run out one of our civilian factories. That's totally fine. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> right, so now that that's completed, we're going to go ahead and skip ahead just by like a minute here in real time. And you'll see that now in our production queue, we are getting the full uh, pr uh, production efficiency. Instead of making just one or two a day, we're making 16 of these infantry, uh, I guess, equipments a day, including guns and grenades. Very, very good. And this is also very useful because as the game progresses, it's, it's very important and vital to ensure that your production line is working at max efficiency. So great, now that that's taken care of, we can focus on something else. Our national focus. So each country in Europe, or sorry, I almost said European Universalis. Each country in Hearts of Iron 4 is going to have their own focus tree. Now the big seven uh, nations like France, UK, Soviet Union, Italy, Japan, uh, who am I missing? United Kingdom, United States, they all have their own unique focus trees that kind of focus somewhat on the history behind things, right? So let's say like the Soviet Union will have events related to perhaps invading Poland, perhaps attacking Japan, perhaps, you know, Chinese border skirmishes, things of that nature, right? Whereas other countries, such as Switzerland, do not have their own unique focus tree. This focus tree that you see here is the same focus tree that every other country besides the Major 7 get. So this is, will be a focus tree that you'll see very often if you play as minor nations just like what I'm doing here today. And I'm not going to go over what each and every single one of these focus trees means. I might make another video for that if you guys are interested in kind of seeing uh, a little bit of how you want to plan your campaign before the game releases on June the 6th. But anyways, we're going to get started immediately on working on a political effort. Now, this is something that I recommend if you are like me and want to switch your government as fast as possible. Because again, we do not want a federal council. We do not want a democratic regime. We want fascism for the people. This is what we want. We want to be friends of the German Reich. We want to be a member of the Axis Alliance. So to that end, we need to work on this particular focus, which is, again, let's go and pop that up really fast. That is in... Da -da 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 -da. I thought it was over here somewhere. Ah, here it is, political effort. So to get to your focus tree, you just click on your flag, which is in the top left, shortcut Q, and click on your focus tree. So again, working on political effort, it will give us an immediate plus 120 political power, which we can then use to buy a fascist demagogue. We'll get into that in a minute. For the time being, we have free civilian factories. Ooh, that's bad. When you see this icon, you need to make sure that you are working on something. We need to build something, right? So as always, in the very beginning of this game, it is of vital importance to set up as many civilian factories as possible. In this case, Switzerland itself is already fully, uh, I guess, decked out in infrastructure, so we need to work on Eastern Switzerland. Now, why, might you ask, would we work on civilian factories? Well, civilian factories are the backbone of our industry in Hearts of Iron 4. I remember I said that this is not a tutorial, but this, this might actually be a little bit like a tutorial, right? We're going to learn something new a little bit as we go on here. So, basically what this means is that each factory, civilian factory that you have, that is not currently producing a trade good uh, used for export, you can use to build a construction, right? Construction screen over here. So what this means is basically the more civilian factories you have, the faster you can develop your industry, the faster you can make military factories, the faster you can make airports, the faster you can make literally everything that you see in this game. So it's of vital importance for us to go ahead and start pumping out these civilian factories as fast as possible. Now unfortunately, because we only have two, our first factory is going to be produced two years from now in June 1938. But this will change very, very fast 
as we will work on some focus trees that will improve our efficiency in making factories. So don't fret, it won't take that long. So let's go ahead and unpause. Well, before we unpause, let's go ahead and select all of our units that you see here. And we're going to go ahead and set them up with a division, or rather an army, right? Because all of these divisions, these 20 divisions, need to be set up in their own army with their own commander. Now, this is also a very interesting aspect of Hearts of Iron 4. In previous games, or rather in Europe Universalis, for example, you know, you select an army, you can promote, you know, basically at any time you're in friendly territory, a general. Well, in this game, it's a bit different. You have two different types of leaders. You have a general and you have a field marshal. So, for example, let's go ahead and promote a commander. Oh, we can't because we don't have any political power. Well, for example, if I promoted General Henry Guisson, Henri Guisson, I believe he's uh, from Western Switzerland where the French-speaking people are. Uh, and Roman D. If we promoted him, he would become a field marshal. Now, this is a good thing for a few different reasons, but it's also a bad thing because each time you promote, you will lose one positive trait. Or no, sorry, I misspoke. All positive traits and one skill point will be lost. So we're not going to promote him for the time being because he has this very, very good winter specialist, uh, I guess, skill, which will give him negative 50% winter attrition. Very, very, very good to have here in the Alps, right? Because when we attack... Uh, I think our first person that we will want to expand into is Austria. Uh, hopefully before Germany pulls off their Anschluss and gets all that Liebentraum before we do. We want to be Germany's southern kind of somewhat German partner. Uh, and to that extent, we need to expand our living space into the east. Hopefully by taking Tyrol and maybe even upper and lower Austria. Well, I, I speak a little bit quickly because we're still this tiny little country that really doesn't have much of anything going for it. So now that we've assigned a leader to Army 1, which we will now name, I don't know, let's say the Mountain Corps, the first Mountain Corps. We are going to go ahead and hit this thing over here called Exercise. Now this is great because all of our units are now going to do push-ups and jumping jacks, and really this is going to keep them in shape. This is going to slowly increase their experience that they gain over time. And really, with any country that you can't immediately declare war on anybody else with, this is probably your best idea uh, from the start, right? Because we can't go to war with Italy, can't go to war with France, Germany, or Austria, even if we wanted to, because we're a democratic country, which means that basically we are stuck with being able to only proclaim uh, guarantees, and it's just boring. We want to either be communist or fascist, and in this Let's Play, we're going to go fascist all the way, baby. So let's go ahead and continue where we left off, right? So with that being said, we are going to unpause the game. And what's really cool in Hearts of Iron is if we enable the, the day-night loop over here. Just checking, okay, allied belt, that's right. So if we do this, if we unpause, you'll see that the game actually has like a day and night cycle, right? Here, I'm going to slow it down a little bit so you guys can see it. This is super, super cool, right? Because at the nighttime, you can see like all the light pollution from the various countries and the various cities from the various production centers. I think this is incredibly, incredibly well done. Paradox Interactive did a very, very good job with this particular functionality. And what's really cool too is that depending on if it's the night or the daytime, your units will actually have different combat modifiers. So for example, if you were fighting at night, you actually lose out a little bit on your vision. I believe your accuracy is decreased. Uh, there are other effects too as well with weather. We'll get into that in a minute. There are snowstorms that can infect your combat efficiency rating, especially with tanks who uh, do not like extreme weather too much. Uh, and this all plays into, you know, your combat efficiency, or efficiency as well as the terrain in the game. So, for example, much like other Paradox Interactive games, if I was to, say, attack <coughs> Austria or Italy into the Alpine Mountains over here, our units would take a lot of casualties in the process of doing so. Well, that is to say if they were not Mountaineer units, which are their own unique units in Hearts of Iron 4. Mountaineer units, like these seen over here, uh, we're going to click on the template, are incredibly good at attacking into and defending mountain territory. These guys are kind of like the ski troops, right? They're, they're equipped with skis. Well, let's use our imagination. I think they're equipped with skis, which is always pretty badass. And they're very, very good at um, really just dealing with mountains in general. So we're going to be working on making some more of those units as well. But for the time being, all of our units are training, which is great. But the problem is is that they need weapons, right? They Look, over here, 278 uh, infantry equipment have yet to be produced from these units over here. So most of my units are only at like 20, 25% combat uh, readiness. 
So these units are much like the units of the Soviet Union at the outbreak of Operation Barbarossa when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. You know, all of the Soviet soldiers weren't really ready. I think it was like one man had the ammo, one man had the gun. We're going to make sure that our soldiers are ready, just like the Germans uh, to the north of us, so that we can work as a combined front. So again, our production is pumping out guns each and every day. We're getting about 16 a day now, which is fantastic. Let's go ahead and speed things up just a little bit. And since we are playing as Switzerland, which is a tiny little country, we are going to be speeding things up quite a bit, just because we have really nothing else to do at the moment. We only have two regions in which to produce uh, civilian factories, military goods, and so on and so forth. So, again, this is something that we need to do for the time being. Now, right now, I could opt to make some more units. We do have approximately 6,000 men at our disposal. But with that being said, we do not want to because we are still missing out on almost 6,500 6, infantry equipment. So we need to make sure that we have guns for our current soldiers before we work on making new soldiers, right? Because that's just common sense. Over here, the remilitarization of the Rhineland, very, very good. <clears throat> it is no more different than the Germans walking into their own backyard, a political commentator in Britain observed. Well... Political commentators in Britain are usually uh, underestimating things. Of course, the Vell Chamberlain was just saying, yeah, let's just go ahead and give Germany, you know, the Sudet Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia. I'm sure Hitler won't take anything else. Let's just appease him. Well, that doesn't work out. I think British foreign policy is pretty bad in World War II, to be quite honest with you guys. So now that we have unlocked um, our political effort, we have immediately gained 120 political power, which we will immediately use to set up a fascist demagogue, Jacob Lorenz. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is that when you gain political power, you can use this to basically buy advisors, right? For really any category, for laws and government, for research and production, for your military staff, each and, each, each and every one of these uh, categories, you could basically hire an advisor, sort of like from Europe Universalis, where they will increase various aspects of the efficiency of your country. So, for example, if I wanted to be a communist, uh, you know, sympathizer, I could go with Rudolf Gelbke. He would give us uh, communism on the rise, but instead we're going to go with a fascist demagogue, which is going to give us the event fascism on the rise. The fascist speakers in Switzerland have made no secret of what they think of our current rulership and political system. Speeches like these have tapped into a public dissent that is particularly pronounced in the more conservative sections of the military. And as with the communist sympathizer, uh, communism on the rise event, you could choose if you would rather have a, the ability for a coup d'etat, which is the top, or if you'd rather have an uprising from like a grassroots sympathies. I normally select the grassroots kind of like uprising sympathies. I don't actually think I've ever selected the top one, which is increasing the chance of internal support for a fascist coup. Let's go with the bottom one. I believe it's a bit of a safer choice. This way we will not get a civil war which will tear our country apart and which I might not be able to recover from. So now that that has been taken, political effort is ours. We're gonna go and work on industrial effort, right? Because this will increase our research bonus for all industry technologies. And also, after we uh, complete the industrial effort, we can work on starting to take the... Uh, let's go back over into the tech tree really fast, which is, again, I'm not too good at this game, obviously. Uh, all logistics, where is it? Da -da 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 -da. Again, I will be making mistakes my first few times I play this game. Uh, yeah, here it is. So the focus tree is over here in your country, uh, country selection tab. I am going to be working on construction effort, which will give us a civilian factory each time we complete it. So construction effort two, uh, infrastructure effort. These will all give us factories, which, will get, which are going to increase our production uh, timers. So that's always a very good thing. Let's go ahead and speed up the game once again. Now, because we have taken a fascist demagogue... Oop, I'm going to go and pause the screen really quick. The Spanish Civil War has broken out which is going to happen in every single Hearts of Iron 4 game, just like it did in real life. Now, basically what this means is that there are two factions in Spain. One is National Spain and one is Republican Spain. Republican Spain are like those dirty communists and dirty Democrats that we do not want to win, whereas National Spain are the glorious fascist sympathizers um, that we would like to win. We do want Franco to win. We want Franco Falangist Spain to win so that we can get some more allies and the Axis later on once we become 
fascists. So we might actually send some volunteers over there in a little bit, but not just yet. Our units are not ready to fight. So that being said, <clears throat> let's go and check our country. With our fascist demagogue, Jacob Lorenz, we are now gaining a daily change of plus 10% popularity to fascism. So now our fascist po uh, party, which is led by Dr. Max Leo Keller, is gaining in popularity. <coughs> Excuse me. What this means is that eventually, if there is no coup or uh, revolution before 1939 in our next election, if this party is more popular than the Federal Democratic Council Party, we have a chance of getting our fascists elected onto, I guess, the, uh, the podium, right? This is only if we want to get our uh, politics elected via the uh, democratic way, which we're probably not going to do, to be honest. I've actually played a game where I played as Communist Ireland, and before our election even fired, that would allow me to kind of vote in the communists. The communists threw in over, like, they, they, they basically just overthrew the government, which is always very, very interesting. So let's go ahead and focus on a new research group. I believe our electric, uh, uh, electronic mechanical engineering is just finished. So we can work on mechanical computing now, which will increase our research time once again. Again, trying to work on these as fast as we can, just because the quicker you basically research into the electronics tree, the more benefit you get out of them, right? Because these will these will reduce the re research time for all of your trees. So if you do this as fast as possible, this will give you the most amount of benefit. Now, if you're playing as a bigger country, say France or Italy that has colonial possessions and the ability to really, you know, go to war pretty much right away, we'd probably focus instead on increasing our military technology right from the get-go. But because we are peaceful, slumbering Switzerland, we need to go ahead and work on our industry first. That being said, speaking of industry, we are still 5,500 guns away from producing enough for everybody while also working on some support equipment as well, which is always a good thing. So, uh, no national focus is set. We've worked on industrial effort. Let's go ahead and work on construction effort. Again, this will create a civilian factory, and I believe uh, Eastern Switzerland, which is always a very good thing. So that, that being said, we've gone ahead and researched our weapons and equipment. Let's go ahead and work on increasing our abilities at armored warfare, because we haven't even researched these little, little land ships from 1918, right? This is something that we need to work on as soon as possible if we are going to have any chance in World War II supporting our German friends. So again, zooming up over here, we see our men are doing some jumping jacks, doing some exercises, kind of showing up on the Austrian border, which is very, very devoid of really any type of soldier or military activity. I'm very, very excited, really to kind of push my way into Austria once we get some German friends. Of course, because we are democratic, as I've said earlier, this will prohibit a lot of our diplomatic ability. But once we switch over to fascists, we will be able to do things like declaring war on people for, uh, you know, Liebenstrom. Always a very, very fun thing. So we have some political power. We can go ahead and buy another um, advisor. Let's go and take a look at what we have available. Silent workhorse, da 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 monthly opinion. Political power gain... Da, 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 da. No, we don't want any of those. And so let's work on a theorist. <clears throat> if we pick up Werner Jenny, he's going to give us plus zero or plus um, 0.05 army experience gain each day. And he's also going to re reduce the amount of time for our land doctrine research time, which is always a very good thing. Let's go and take him to kind of increase the experience of our soldiers before they even fight. And really, you guys can take a look at all the various options we have while we're waiting. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull those up in just a second. But for now, we need to go ahead and research something new. Let's go ahead and research basic machine tools to increase our production efficiency, which is what I'm going to talk about right now. So we go to our uh, production tab over here. Each production line that we have, and we can actually make new production lines, just that we don't have any resources to make them with, so we're not going to bother. Uh, each production line that you make that will obviously use up your military factories and naval dockyards, depending on if it's a ship or a land or air unit, um, will basically use up your factories, right? So we're using three military factories to produce infantry equipment right now. We have a production efficiency of 50% because these factories have been making military equipment for a while now. Now, if we were to add new um, military factories and set them up with, uh, you know, making infantry equipment, or if we were to switch, let's say, this production tab into making tanks, our production efficiency will go down. 
But over time, the longer your factories uh, make a specific type of unit, the more efficient they get. So by taking basic machine tools, we can increase our efficiency from 50 to 55%. That's basically the cap for us at the moment. So let's go ahead and unpause once again. And as we've unpaused, I told you guys that I'd take a look at all of the different options we have available for advisors. Over here, you can see I'm just going to mouse over. You can always pause the movie or pause the video if you want to take a look at exactly what these guys are. So these are just political advisors. We don't need them. Industrials, you can basically hire companies, which is always good. Material designers, you can do... Okay, we'll go back to them in just a second. We're going to go and work on, again, another construction effort. This will also give us yet another civilian factory. If we go over to constructions, you'll see that instead of two factories, we now have four that are working on making a new one. So instead of in June of 1938, we're actually going to expect this next one to be up in February of next year. This will be even faster as we work on our next focus, right? So again, there's lots of different options to choose here. You can work on artillery designers. Basically, you want to select advisors for basically everything once you have the political power to do so. And these will allow you to specialize your nation into particular types of warfare, particular types of strategies. Really, it's entirely up to you. So let's see. German athletes won the most out of the Olympic Games. They won 33 gold medals, while the Americans won 24. Da -da 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 -da. Jesse Owens won the most. I don't think this changes each time. I think this is just a historical flavor text. Although maybe it does change. I'm not exactly 100% sure. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching episode 1 of Fascist Switzerland and Hearts of Iron 4. Uh, as you guys can see, our fascist support is on the rise. In the next episode, we will initiate our fascist coup d'etat, become a fascist Swiss country, our fascist Swiss regime, and become friends with Nazi Germany. Maybe we'll even set our sights on Austria. So again, thank you so much for watching episode one and stay tuned for episode two. Let me try that again. Thank you so much for staying uh, with me for episode one. Stay tuned for episode two where we become friends with Nazi Germany and set our sights on the eastern Austrian territories over here. Thanks again, guys, for watching and I'll see you on the next episode. Take care.